We did not accept the decision to recognize Israel. We would accept no further compromise. Arafat's UN speech would be a difficult balancing act. I hereby once more declare that I condemn terrorism in all its forms. That was for the Americans. And in a pattern that was to characterize the whole speech, the next phrase was for the PLO radicals. And at the same time, salute those sitting before me in this hall, who, in the days when they fought to free their countries from the yoke of colonialism, were accused of terrorism. He concluded his speech convinced he had pleased everyone. Uh, I reviewed it with President Reagan, who was following this closely. And I said, well, Mr. President, in one part of his statement, he said, unk, unk, unk. And the other part of his statement, he said, kul, kul, kul. But nowhere did he say uncle. So, no, it's not satisfactory. Word soon came that the Americans had rejected the balancing act. Arafat's closest advisors implored him to say exactly what Schultz demanded. I saw that Arafat had a dilemma whether to say it or not. Should he sit tight or should he try again? The next morning, Arafat called a press conference. I repeat for the record that we totally and absolutely renounce all forms of terrorism. I view this development as one more step toward the beginning of direct negotiations between the parties, which alone can lead to such a peace. But Israel's prime minister was unimpressed. Shamir made a gesture. It meant, this isn't important. Let's not waste time analyzing what Arafat said. We cannot trust them. They are criminals, they are liars, they are enemies of our people. Shamir's view of Arafat was reinforced 18 months later. On August 2, 1990, Iraq's Saddam Hussein sent his army into Kuwait. He boasted that, in a war, Israel would end up in flames. Saddam's only support came from Libya, Sudan, and the PLO. You know, the war will not be only in Baghdad. This war, if it starts, it will be in the whole area. For this, it will be a real catastrophe. Israel prepared for an attack. As President Bush set out to build a coalition to force Saddam out of Kuwait, he traveled to Damascus to bring Syria into the fold. But President Assad, a firm Arab nationalist, was not easy to convince. President Assad made very clear to me that he blamed Israel for everything. Uh, I'm not sure he blamed him, blamed him for Iraq going into Kuwait, but he got almost everything. Everything was all about Israel. I made clear to him that we didn't want to link any Middle East peace process talks to whipping Saddam Hussein. But I made clear to him also that we would be involved in trying to be a catalyst for peace for Arabs and Israelis. As the war started, Saddam ordered an attack on Israel with Scud missiles. Saddam hoped that by attacking Israel, he would get the support of other Arab countries. If Israel retaliated, 
he might be able to undermine the coalition against him. Iraq's missiles were aimed indiscriminately at Israel's largest cities. The repeated attacks over many nights were nerve-wracking. The Israeli press reported that Palestinians celebrated as the missiles flew over the West Bank on the way to Tel Aviv. Chemical traces in one of the missiles even raised the possibility of a deadly chemical attack. Uh, we would like to see that threat removed, and we will uh, uh, take the uh, actions that are necessary to remove it. Uh, I cannot tell you when, I cannot tell you where. In the end, Israel did not retaliate, but its leaders had learned a hard lesson about their vulnerability. Shamir was also absolutely convinced that given the opportunity, Israel's Arab enemies would try to destroy it. When the war with Iraq ended, President Bush looked towards the future. We must do all that we can to close the gap between Israel and the Arab states and between Israelis and Palestinians. There can be no substitute for diplomacy. The time has come to put an end to Arab-Israeli conflict. The idea was the president, at the height of his prestige, sending the secretary of the state at the height of his prestige to the Middle East. And what we basically hoped was that no one would have the nerve to say no to the United States at that moment. Bush instructed Secretary of State James Baker to persuade the Arabs and Israelis to attend a new peace conference. Well, the whole idea that, that we came up with was to give the Arabs what they needed and give the Israelis what they needed. The bone of contention between Israel and Syria was still the Golan Heights, captured by Israel 20 years earlier. In Damascus, Baker suggested to President Assad that if he came to the conference, Israel might negotiate a withdrawal from the Golan Heights. We are not negotiating whether the Golan would come back or not, whether part of it would stay under the Israeli control or not. The whole of the Syrian Golan should come back to Syria. Having gotten nowhere with the Syrians, Baker then tried to tempt Yitzhak Shamir to the peace conference. I remember saying, it's going to be one big meeting that is going to lead then to bilateral negotiations so that the Israeli government could say, well, this is really not an international conference. I wouldn't even consider it. It meant negotiating with PLO terrorists. Baker promised Shamir he would not invite the PLO to the conference. Baker then went to meet Palestinian leaders from the West Bank and Gaza. We in the PLO leadership opposed them meeting Baker. For us, this meeting was pointless. We thought it would not advance the Palestinian cause. Some comrades argued that the Americans wanted to create an alternative leadership to replace the PLO. For five nights, Abu Mazen urged the PLO leadership to let Palestinians from the occupied territories meet with Baker. Finally, Yasser Arafat decided he had nothing to lose. Only it is a meeting, exploratory, uh, exploratory meeting, nothing, nothing more. If things would proceed positively, then the leadership would take the credit. If things did not work out, then we as individuals would take the blame. When the Palestinians met Baker in Jerusalem, the PLO insisted that each Palestinian delegate be approved in writing by Arafat.
I said to him, Mr. Secretary, this meeting could not have taken place without the authorization of President Arafat personally. And I took the letter out of my pocket, showed it to him.